Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in uh, for this session today, which we have uh, for for which is a fireside chat uh, with the experts uh, from architecture and uh, system design. Uh, so uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, before we get uh, get started with the fireside chat, I'd like to you know take a minute uh, to quickly uh, introduce our uh, panelists uh, for the day, and uh, along with the moderator. So we have in our panel uh, Arpit Mohan, who is the co-founder and CTO at AppSmith. And Arpit is basically a veteran startup uh, founder with multiple you know uh, secure. Axel Partners and YC backed up startups under his belt. And uh, he loves trying to solve uh, hard problems by leveraging technology. Currently, he is the founder and uh, like I mentioned, he's the founder and CTO at AppSmith, uh, which is a low code application uh, development platform. Very happy to have you with us, uh, Arpit, today. And uh, now moving on to our next uh, uh, panelist. So we have Ramji uh, Ganti. Who, who, who's the founder of uh, Deep Blue Inc. And uh, he has uh, 17 plus years of uh, experience leading engineering at multiple startups. And uh, he is an eclectic mix of tech, product, business acumen uh, with a healthy dose of curiosity and earnestness. Uh, more than happy to have you with us, uh, Ramji. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to the fireside chat. And uh, moving on, uh, let me take a minute to uh, a, a minute to introduce uh, Shubendu, who is the co-founder and CEO at Skilenza, and he will be moderating the fireside chat. But before that, he'd also like to introduce you all uh, to to the uh, architecture uh, battle, uh, which is currently live. And uh, with that, I'll hand over the platform over to you, uh, Shubendu, to take it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Azhar, um, uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, hi, guys. Uh, thanks for coming um, on this evening. Uh, this is a Friday. I guess everybody would be thinking about TGIF, but not possible in this COVID world, right? So let's try to see if we can make uh, this session interesting. So I have very good uh, um, in, uh, friends of mine, Arpit and Ramji, uh, just not uh, uh, they're, they're, we work with them as clients or partners, but they're very good friends. and. Uh, I have learned a lot from them by just understanding how products are built. And I guess uh, you guys will also enjoy the session with them on building uh, right away uh, products from scratch to how uh, uh, they are going to scale, right? So how do we uh, think about scaling products? How about think, think about building products? And how do we factor in uh, things like cost and security and uh, other things, right? Uh, so we'll go through it. Uh, the format would be that... Uh, uh, we'll make it interactive. I will. Uh, I have few set of questions that uh, we have prepared, and I would want uh, expert opinions of Arpit and Ramji on that. And uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the live comment or the YouTube channel. Uh, Azar will uh, get it uh, collated, and we will answer it uh, by end of the program. So before I move there, uh, I guess uh, most of you guys know about Scalenza. Uh, we are a platform for uh, people like you uh, to come and. Uh, showcase your skills by participating in hackathons and competitions. And uh, based on how you perform, uh, you get connected to the right job, internship, you get prize money, you get bragging rights, right? Uh, we work with uh, brands like Microsoft, Society General, ThoughtWorks. We work with startups like Danzo. Uh, we work with AppSmith. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the programs that we run with Microsoft uh, is uh, called Arc uh, League. This is a community of uh, architecture and um, you know, system design enthusiasts, people who are practicing software architecture. And uh, we have launched a competition called Arc Battle, which, and this uh, webinar is part of that, where uh, we want uh, you guys to build uh, system design uh, architect uh, products, which uh, uh, is very relevant in this COVID world. Uh, the, the theme is uh, video, uh, basically, and there are sub themes around video streaming, live streaming. So check out our page. Uh, uh, Azhar will share that with you uh, during the event. Uh, and we have the deadline coming up for participation. There are very interesting prize money. And also, there'll be uh, quite interesting uh, other uh, offers coming uh, your way. 
So before I start, uh, I would like uh, Arpit and Ramji to briefly introduce themselves and their journey, uh, and then we'll move to the the questions, uh, the sequence of questions I have. Uh, off to you, Arpit. Uh, cool, awesome. Uh, this is what I look like to begin with, uh, and uh, as uh, Azhar was saying, uh, like for the past uh, decade or so, I've had the the fortune of working. Uh, uh, you know, co-founding and uh, multiple startups uh, uh, with Sequoia, with Axel Partners. Uh, we went to uh, a y, y Combinator as well uh, in our previous com uh, in as part of a previous startup. And uh, throughout this entire journey, uh, I've been uh, had a chance to work in uh, you know a, a myriad of different industries, ranging from logistics, video processing, telecom, gaming, and uh, this time around, uh, at this moment, we are running the startup called AppSmith, which is uh, essentially a, a low-code builder or a front-end as a service. So, for all you, you know, platform engineers like me and like you know, like uh, Ramji as well, all you architects out there who hate uh, writing React code, uh, this is uh, a startup for you guys. And uh, in fact, uh, we are also kind of launching an open-source uh, uh, edition of our entire product. And uh, yeah, you can always check us out on appsmith.com, check out what we do, and you know maybe check our GitHub uh, page as well for our open source uh, community edition as well. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, largely it from my end. Hi, Ramji. Uh, yeah, Ramji is also here. Hi, everyone. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, This is Ramji here. Uh, thanks, Shubendu, uh, for... Uh, calling me over for this chat. Uh, to introduce about myself, uh, I had been, uh, as Azhar mentioned, uh, involved with startups in uh, leading the technology uh, from uh, very young or uh, no team members except me, right, uh, to uh, exits. So I uh, notably, I was working with uh, Justit as uh, head of technology. Uh, those who are in Bangalore, uh, you would have been familiar with this company. Uh, which was a precursor to the existing Zig Swiggy and Zomato, right? Uh, we were in food ordering space. Um, I kind of built from about 100 orders a day. We kind of scaled up to a uh, few hundred thousand uh, a month. I mean, um, with the max, uh, this thing, this was pre pre uh, a cloud uh, days that we are now familiar with. Uh, and uh, subsequently, I was with another startup in FinTech, uh, which was again uh, bought by News Corp. Uh, I was a uh, CTO there, uh, which was uh, uh, essentially I got my experience in publishing, uh, which is very different from uh, uh, e-com or uh, logistics space, right? Um, then I was uh, build building products at a marketing technology company, and currently I run my own uh, company, Deep Blue. Uh, Deep Blue, we basically help uh, companies with uh, ML engineering, machine learning engineering. So we have our own product, uh, which uh, helps in monitoring uh, machine learning models. Uh, it's a few months uh, since we started off this, uh, so that's that's my journey in brief, and uh, excited to talk to you all. Thank you, Ramji. Uh, that was a very detailed uh, uh, journey. I think it, it's it's fun to see both of you guys uh, from the different uh, backgrounds, right? And uh, Arpit, uh, I would definitely like some of your inputs when we talk about architecture. How uh, how do we deal with video, right? And in this uh, COVID world, video has become the way of communication, right? Uh, so the the theme of this uh, architecture battle is also video. So that'll be great if you can throw some light on the video pieces while we are designing products. So uh, let's start uh, the chat. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we all like, uh, you both of you are founders also. And uh, being a founder, we all speak about a very common term, right? Uh, our lingo is called as minimum viable product. So uh, when I think about that and I map it to a software design, is there something called minimum viable architecture? Do you think about it when you're designing a product? Uh, do you come up with a basic architecture or how do you take it forward, right? So uh, it'll be great if you can start. Cool, yeah. Uh, I think... Uh the actual term minimum viable architecture to be honest uh, this is the first time i'm actually hearing the word, like these three words put together uh, but i think uh, uh, deep down that is what uh, all of us sort of do uh, whenever we kind of design any system from the ground up whenever it's a new product uh, this is what we are kind of essentially doing 
is trying to come up with an architecture that can get executed or built really quickly uh, that can get launched fairly quickly and that's stable enough to to handle whatever uh, you know use case your uh, product or your startup is doing uh, so th- at least the way i kind of think about uh, you know minimum viable architecture is i try to picture uh, what is going to happen uh, in the product or in the business uh, six months down the line and i kind of only sort of uh, look at six months uh, sort of slots okay, you know uh, so whatever architecture that we designed for today um, uh, this should work in six months and in six months t- by six months time you have more information you have more information about uh, from the market from your users and you can then take better calls so because the first iteration is largely going to be uh, us sort of guessing what the user probably needs what features would they probably want in what uh, directions is the business going to pull the product into so uh, a lot of these things are sort of guesses so in order to kind of balance what you are building for and what you know your users will ask for uh, i kind of look at like a 6 uh, month sort of window and anything that is unclear or is you know possibly a user might ask for this or they might ask for that um it's uh, i prefer kind of uh, leaving sort of extension points in the system that allows the system to get uh, extended in that direction but that is not something that we will build out today so so in that sense the entire system is sort of architected generally as uh, you know with a lot of extension points uh most of which will never get used and uh, and yeah and every 6 months you sort of take stock okay what's not working for us let's go and uh, refactor that bit of our system or let's go re- change that the other bit of our system uh yeah that's pretty much how i would think about a minimum viable architecture got it thank you arvind uh, ramji uh, what do you think uh, like how do you start uh, when you think about building a product yeah so i agree with uh, arpit on uh, this point right i mean you think of uh, in chunks of 6 uh, months or so i mean we follow a slightly uh, different approach but uh, essentially it boils down to that you 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 don't know what will happen uh, going forward the important thing is always remember like uh, uh, unless you are probably the tech is your product right i mean for most of us uh, who are trying to build uh we are not building tech products we are basically building products that users use and tech is enabling building that product you have to remember that which is the key uh, distinction which makes which implies that uh whatever you are trying to build first the functionality is most important so you may put in the best architecture possible you may put in all kinds of fancy uh, uh technology but uh, if nobody is using it because you have not built the necessary features uh your startup is not going anywhere right so the first thing is uh, as we call mvp uh, from even from an mba perspective uh, it's important that uh, you focus on building what your users need and initially uh, especially at startups or if you are asking some question like this even in a larger company it's important for you to understand what your product does right that's the most important thing that i believe the second thing the way i normally approach is typically uh, think through i mean uh, what uh, arpit mentioned as extension points i normally have this particular thing right like uh, you think of about uh, 150% of the requirements that you know like you know x requirements uh, of why your product uh, uh, what your product has to do um, like as an architect and uh, the person who is responsible for uh, building this from ground up you should be thinking a little ahead of what would happen like maybe in the next 3 months 6 months what kind of like if you are experienced you would know there are some things which will change right i mean uh, an example is let's say you capture four fields as attributes for uh, users now you will know as you go ahead you will probably want extra fields right i mean uh, in the, in terms of the demography details so don't kind of close it off uh, up front so uh, what i, I, I arpit calls as extension point i say that basically plan for it that it will happen your user table will grow with more attributes and all so don't kind of seal it off uh, uh upfront uh, right and but then when you implement don't implement all the things that you have thought of right in fact mm-hmm. i normally go ahead and uh, consider only about 60 70% of the features to be implemented upfront because what will happen is uh, the most important thing at your early stage is you also be involved in the feedback loop uh, from your target users 
and uh, if you go and build everything up front you will realize once you hit the user who are going to give you the actual feedback um, some things have to be changed so leave that room open don't kind of commit yourself uh, with 100% of whatever you have to build um, build it uh, like all the primary paths and uh, all of it but then uh, your architecture also think of it in that way where you leave uh, scope for it to grow as uh, you get more feedback right Got it. That's, that's, that's cool. where I uh, that's the approach I see, yeah. And it has worked for me multiple times. I mean, uh, so yeah, I'm sure uh, I have uh, a little bit of validation from Arpit too over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you guys uh, both have seen uh, journeys of products at very early stage, right? And it scaled them up uh, to a good, uh, decent stage. So that that was very uh, uh, good insight. And I totally agree with you. Uh, our user tables are also increasing on a daily basis now. <laughs> So, uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, when I speak to a lot of these uh, founders, right, when they are very early stage or people who are uh, thinking to build products, uh, they always talk about, hey, uh, what should I use? What what stack should I use? Right, uh, front end, back end. Uh, what is hot nowadays? Um, let's use React because it's very popular. Uh, because Facebook is uh, powering it, or let's use uh, no no SQL databases. So, how do you decide? As an uh, architect, like what is uh, the real, the actual technology stack, right? From your front end, back end, to cloud and uh, other things, right? So, how, what is the decision making criteria there? Uh, okay, so from from my end, it's literally okay. So, uh, uh, sort of draw a Venn diagram of <laughs> what you know. So, forget the hottest language. Think about because the first few months, it's largely going to be. Uh, maybe a very small team of people implementing uh, that feature or you know that product. So uh, forget about what's the coolest language out there. If you are a Java person, like that's great. Like just do Java. If you are a Rust person, then just do Rust. Uh, basically, sort of do what you know best. Most languages will work in most scenarios, so that's typically not uh, a concern. Uh, so draw Venn diagram between what you know and what you can hire for. So, so for example, like I probably wouldn't do a new startup in Rust because it makes uh, hiring a lot harder or expanding the team a lot harder. So, yeah. So whatever, optimize just for these two things: what you know and what you can hire for. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, suggestion. In fact, because we work with companies for their hiring needs. Uh, we know we have tried for Rust. It, it becomes difficult, right? So some of these languages are still uh, difficult, uh, at least in India, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to find talent. And that's a great suggestion to do a Venn diagram when you're thinking about your technology stack. Ramji, what do you what do you think? Uh, uh, how how should no, the same 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 thoughts, right? I mean, I think in the early stage you don't go wrong with any technology that you choose, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, the important thing uh, is, uh, do you know that? Uh, and uh, the other point, as uh, Arpit mentioned, is can you hire uh, a few people uh, who know that, right? So uh, to give an example, uh, about 10 years back and all, uh, PHP used to be the uh, in language where a lot of people uh, used to know PHP. Uh, but if you look at it now, uh, Python has uh, kind of a Node.js. Uh, you have more talent available there. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think uh, the first priority for me would be like, what language do you know and uh, how comfortable you are with? Because in the initial few months, it's you uh, who are going to drive the whole thing. Uh, that's the most important thing. And then, of course, uh, then how uh, how people, what kind of people you can find, right? Uh, saying that, if you are, again, in a very niche area, like let's say, let's say video streaming and all, you may have to do a little bit of homework to figure out what frameworks do you, do you want to use from a server perspective and uh, stuff like that. But otherwise, uh, uh, if you are uh, looking at any kind of uh, front end, back end stuff, uh, stick to what you know. Doesn't matter whether the technology is uh, in thing or the hot thing in the market, right? Doesn't matter. If you have to use pure jQuery and build it, there is nothing wrong with it. That is how applications used to be built for uh, uh, a decade or so before React came on, uh, React came on board or Angular came on board, right? So there is nothing wrong with it. There is no shame in it. Uh, please stick to the technologies that you know in the initial phase. And the, the most important part, again, goes back to you have to have your North Star, which is like, how is your company doing? Not your 
product doing and how are you building right that is your north star in the initial phases it's not your technology which is the north star the north star is how your company is doing are you able to churn out features in uh, the quick iterations which you would need to kind of showcase to your potential customers or get your customers to get on to a poc or whatever be your uh, metric that you are measuring right uh, yeah so stick to what you know uh, in 90% of the cases uh, you would know enough to actually get your product out in the first few months right got it and have you uh, from both of your uh, personal experience or in your network have you seen people kind of uh, uh, the founders or uh, starting the product with a stack that they are comfortable with uh, but then when uh, the company is scaling they really face challenge in, in the hiring and then they switch uh, stack which will bring uh, uh, to my next question because uh, uh, we have spoken about uh, scaling and choosing a stack but once the company scales and either you are seeing scale uh, at a very different level and you want to uh, uh, re-architect your product or you are ab not able to find technology talent uh, that you had planned five years or three years back, right? So how do you in, uh, take care of these two scenarios uh, from your personal experience or anything that you have seen in the network? Uh, uh, Arpit, I'll take. Yeah, yeah, yeah please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Shubhendu, I'm not uh, very sure that happens. I mean, in fact, the way I see is as you scale, uh, what also happens is very rarely uh, once your product scales, right, uh, would you stick to only one technology? I mean, invariably what happens is um, uh, that's where, again, the architecture comes in, right? I mean, uh, you would probably look at a, uh, a modular architecture where... Uh, and I, 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 I mean, it will basically extend to saying you will want to use something like... Uh, uh, uh earlier it was called soa now we call microservices and all i'll not get into that at this point but essentially if you have built a modular architecture and as you scale what happens is some of these modules have to be rewritten and um you will choose what language is more appropriate depending on the constraints that your overall uh, system imposes on it right uh saying that i have seen companies switch from one particular language to a different language but uh, invariably, uh, I don't know. I mean, I have not seen, at least in my experience, I have not seen uh, people uh, having problem hiring. What actually uh, ended up happening, at least uh, with a few of firms that I know, including uh, our own uh, at both Just Eat and Big Decisions, is that the moment where you need something else, your existing team itself will scale up, right? I mean, uh, they, they will uh, learn on the job and uh, they will be able to do uh, uh, a good job. Uh, of course, you will have to reach out to mentors who are experts there if you don't have that expertise at all. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have in my limited experience, I have not faced uh, this hiring challenge as we go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, to extend to what Ramji is saying, uh, uh, so I was part of uh, one uh, big rewrite with, uh, uh, with, this com with this startup called Exotel. I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of them. Uh, so the initial code, when they started out in 2009, 2010, uh, the founders, they knew PHP because that's what everybody knew back in the day. And uh, so the first, uh, so, and the business ran, it was a profitable business. They were growing really well. Uh, and they reached a point where, you know, the, the, the PHP stack started to break for, break for them. And, uh, and that's when, uh, uh, you know, I was involved in like a, uh, and it was like a two year sort of project for them to move from PHP to Golang. And they essentially rewrote all their microservices, all their services across the board over a period of two years and switched completely to Golang. So, uh, uh, so any sort of change in language, uh, especially like across the board like this takes a considerable amount of time especially if you're a mature business or you have a lot of customers who rely on you um, and it does not happen overnight. Uh, so that's something that I wouldn't uh, worry about uh, because by the time it comes to uh, you rewriting and you kind of changing a lot of these things, uh, your team is also bigger at that point. If you're like four people uh, who started out and five years later, you're still those four engineers and because you never needed to expand and you, you had really good engineers or whatever, your team didn't really need to grow. 
uh, then you don't need to change from say PHP to something else. You know, you're happy with PHP. It works for you. So, so go for it. But uh, more often than not, you know, maybe a few years down the line, you're no longer four people, but you're like 50 people. At that point, it becomes easier because to uh, it also becomes a little easier to actually switch languages because now you have people with a diverse skill set. They've come from different backgrounds. Somebody came from Node.js, somebody came from Java, somebody came from there. So they, they, your team can also help you move and your team will also help you guide uh, your future direction. And it does not necessarily have to be one way. It's not that just you as an architect or you as a senior developer, et cetera, are, are, are guiding the team. You will also get a lot of guidance from the team that, hey, maybe like 50% of your team already knows Node.js. So maybe that's where you should move to, you know, so. Yeah, Got it. yeah that's the, I think, uh, thank you for the answer. That, that's great to know, actually. So in mm -hmm. fact, we have a very um, interesting or, or funny comment from one of our listeners. So Bhaskar says, I always choose what's not going to cost me anything for as long as possible while bootstrapping a project. I think that's what we all founders think, right? How can we save money? Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, I think that's a, that's a funny comment. Uh, sorry, uh, so uh, to your point, Shubhendu, sorry, when you started out, you also uh, included uh, how do you choose your cloud provider? I think you added that as well. Yeah. And uh, even though I know this, uh, this whole event is sponsored by uh, Microsoft, yeah. um, uh, whoever gives you the most credits, man, like just go to the cloud provider that gives you the most credits. Microsoft has also come up with a new program, $25,000 credit, so we can <laughs> talk to <Yeah>. them. <laughs> like whoever is giving you the most credits, just go there. Like whatever product it is, whatever cloud provider, especially right. cloud provider, it does not matter. Yeah, yeah, great. Cool. So, uh, but uh, uh, this is according, uh, this was on the language and stack piece, right? But what about the architecture? Do we... Do you guys see that once we, uh, you have scaled, you, you think that, hey, we need to probably think in uh, very differently now because uh, our users are maybe spending more time or we are going to more devices. For example, let's say you are on iOS and suddenly you have to go to Android and there's multiple devices now. So do you think uh, that uh, there, how do you think about the architecture when scale happens, right? And how do you change it, right? Like I said, it probably won't happen overnight. But uh, uh, people who are going to become architects or moving to system design, how should they think about those things? Right. Uh, sorry, Ramji, can I take this? Yeah, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, so, okay, so there are two sort of scenarios that I would break this down into. Uh, so in my experience in our previous company, uh, we literally saw scale overnight. So we were growing at 15% day on day. So that means over a period of three months, we went from having 100 users on our platform to about uh, 100K, uh, 100,000 people, uh, DAU, daily active users on our platform uh, and a million downloads on the Play Store. Uh, so literally for us, you know, we hit that jackpot and you know, we got lucky with, uh, you know, with life and we went, our, our app went viral. So, so that's one sort of scale wherein now uh, you're seeing a lot of users. Uh, coming on to one and we were only on Android. And so we were just seeing a lot of users come in there. The other part, as you mentioned, Shubhendu, is where you are diversifying on platforms. Today you're on web, tomorrow you want to be on iOS, then you want to be on Android, you want to be yeah. a Mac app or whatever, whatever. So that's a little bit of different thing. Uh, so when, if you're seeing a lot of influx of users, you know, your app or your product goes viral or, you know, et cetera. At that point, think of it as, uh, as if, if you're driving like an F1 car, so you're going like really, really fast. At that point, all you can hope to do is hold the steering straight and just hold on for dear life. Uh, <laughs> don't swing your steering like this. You know, you can't do that. You can't do that when you're doing going at like 300 kph. You can do that when you're sort of getting your car out of your garage. You know, so, so at that point, you have maneuverability in terms of uh, things you can do, things you can try out, etc. But if you're going like fast, at that point, just hold on and hold on for dear life. Uh, this is the same thing uh, I was talking to uh, the first engineer at Facebook. And um, and she was saying, uh, she kind of uh, was talking about a very similar sort of situation where Facebook suddenly saw scale. And all they were trying to do at that point was not about, you know, uh, their life was no longer about code review and, uh, you know, we are going to do this test case and, you know, we're going to do this, you know, uh, this you know, whatever release management process and whatnot. Uh, they were just like, you know, if 
the code works on your local just push to prod you know like literally that's how facebook got built um yeah so so that's the way i would kind of think about it uh yeah okay. if you get lucky with scale don't change much just just stick to what you know at that point right cool right cool yeah so yeah, not so much no and uh, sorry i'm hearing my sorry i'm hearing yeah yeah uh, okay uh yeah so uh, the my my view uh, is similar so the way i see it is um, uh see i mean uh, when, when you uh, try to say i want to architect uh, many times you might want to go deep into it and all of it but uh, it's only your users and their usage and the scale at which it grows or the rate at which it grows right um, is what decides so don't uh, worry too much about it uh, one good thing with cloud that i have faced is uh, i mean uh, if you have uh, a situation like this where a lot of users are coming in probably uh, for a short duration you can throw hardware at it and solve a lot of problems i mean so do, so don't discount that don't fret that uh, you have to fix all of these issues right now i mean yes it's important to fix them but uh, uh, also understand with cloud uh, you have some flexibility in terms of the hardware that you can spin up uh, at uh, at a very quick notice right and uh, as long as you understand these concepts of uh, how you add uh, some of these and you are true to some if your architecture was not very screwed up right i mean uh, uh, you 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 will be fine uh, as uh, arpit said i like the example of f1 right don't even ever think of uh, uh, any small modifications right you just hold the steering and that's all you need to do i mean uh, because that will make sure you will at least pass that intense um, intense pressure and mind you this will not last right i mean even if you are going very fast the intense scale would be there for a few weeks or so uh, which is uh, after that you will have some breather you know like okay i am burning money but i have uh, put in the cloud infrastructures to handle at least this load or uh, if you 2x 3x that load right i mean uh, you know how to fix that in the two weeks uh, and then you can go back to your basics and uh, look at uh, how you want to rearchitect and all uh most important uh, don't don't move your steering right i mean uh, completely with that with on that cool thank you yeah. ramji i think uh, the f1 example is quite bang on <laughs> so we yeah. should keep yeah. that in mind uh, so uh, one of the things like now we moved uh, uh, we started with mvp or mva uh, we talked about technology stack and then how to uh, scale now you have you are a probably let's say 100 engineer or 150 engineer company and uh, you have an attrition happening right every year there are 10 or 15 engineers leaving the company and probably 15 20 new joining so there how do you get uh, rid of the tech debt right how do you actually refactor the codes that so many engineers have written or probably uh, this the founder had written 6 years back 5 years back uh, how, what is the right way of doing it because i i think uh, we also see it uh, every day in our company and from my personal experience i also want to understand how do you Uh, take care of this uh, feature right uh, the getting rid of the tech debt uh, cool uh, that's a very good question shubhendu this is something that uh, i think uh, all engineering teams at some point uh, not at some point are con- they constantly struggle so uh, here i would say uh, two things over here uh, two very very unsexy answers uh, unfortunately uh the first one is it's it starts a little top uh, not little it starts top down but the philosophy of test 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 there is nothing else that will save you but test 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 uh automated testing whether you have uh, whether you have like uh, uh, like manual qa or automated qa or you have it uh, running on your uh, ci system whatever it is at whatever point like just test because uh, that's your best way to kind of catch and resolve a lot of these tech debts uh, at least you will stop accruing the debt you know you, so you start paying off the interest uh, like you know on your loan so tech debt is nothing but like a loan that you take right and so you start paying off at least the interest bit so that you don't get a compounded you know if you let it run rampant uh, it's just going to compound and you know sort of throw your entire product out you know 5 years down the line or 10 years down the line so that's one uh, and as part of that whole testing methodology and you know the whole uh, 
uh, industry that exists around that. The motto around uh, uh, make the change easy, then make the easy change. So basically, what this quote really sort of talks about is sort of creating leverage for yourself. Uh, by leverage, I mean, ki, what is it that I can do? Like, I will bite the bitter pill today so that uh, I don't have to do this tomorrow. You know, so and constantly sort of doing that, ki, you sort of make the change easy first. So whether it's refactoring your code, refactoring your infra, your design, your whatever it is, uh, changing that and then uh, uh, sort of then making that easy change that, oh, we just need to add this one microservice or we just need to add this one class or we need to do this one thing. So, yeah. Oh, got it. I think the, like, the two unsexy answers are quite sexy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Everybody hates it. Nobody likes it. I know, but that's the reality, right? I think uh, as engineers uh, people, and also as, as a product owner, I know uh, how much debt we have. We have to clear it someday. Otherwise, it'll just uh, break down, right? Uh, so you're right. I mean, testing is, is uh, it should be priority uh, among the, I think the product managers, the architects, the engineering managers all should be like uh, together on the same page, right? When it comes to testing the product. Ramji, what, what do you think? Like, how, do, how should we take care of the tech debt? So you you mentioned one of the things that uh, uh, just now, right? I mean, uh, in addition to Arpit's point, the thing it is important is uh, it's important to understand that there will always be debt. Okay, I mean, uh, unfortunately, you can't be reliance, right? I mean, you can't be debt free. Um, you you will always have debt. Okay, I I have not come across anybody who says no. We have been perfect stuff uh, working. So it's it's basically the baseline. You have to understand and appreciate the fact that debt is also essential a lot of times. I mean, uh, because uh, you, you again, it goes back to the thing, right? You may have the perfect architecture, but then if you are not in time to the market or if you don't solve the you know, features as your customers request, it's all useless, right? I mean, in my mind, it's not going to help you. So debt is important. Now, what you can do, I mean, one, of course, uh, a bit uh, touched upon, which is testing. Apart from that, I have one more point to add, uh, which is, uh, try to get your tooling in place, uh, if not at the start, as you grow, right? I mean, uh, and ensure that all your uh, tools are in place. Uh, essentially, around uh, and somebody commits, uh, do you have uh, pre-commit hooks uh, which check for the styling of the code and uh, which ensures that uh, I mean, uh, everybody uh, like you can. You there are lots of for every language. Uh, there are linters available. There are style sheets available. And uh, this is very important. People don't realize that, but uh, it actually kills a lot of time of developers when they are trying to merge the code and uh, various other things like that. And <clears throat> one uh, that is one particular thing you need to have. The other thing, again, unsexy, a lot of times not followed. Uh, but see if you can have a good amount of uh, documentation. And here I'm not talking about uh, uh, documentation around uh, uh, the code or uh, uh, things like that, right? Uh, at least a higher level documentation of uh, how your architecture is, what are the various elements, because I have seen it multiple times where uh, suddenly something happens and uh, you are really stuck for, okay, where is this particular, how is this design? What are the various modules which are there? Now, the only way to do that is going to the code, right? So if you can follow, I mean, again, I know it is very hard living through that and uh, telling that I know it's not going to be easy, at least in the earlier stages. But see if you can maintain uh, a little high-level documentation of uh, how you have. It need not be, again, like uh, you are updating it uh, as and when it changes, right? You can have a calendar request or whatever it is, which says every one month I just review it for uh, half an hour, see that all these architecture diagrams are at one place. That's it. I mean, uh, you, you are not going to kind of create reams and reams of uh, documentation and books, right? Ensure that you have. Uh, your uh, documentation is available in one place. It can be very crude. Many a times for us, these documents basically mean uh, handwritten diagrams on the whiteboard, right? That's all. We take a screenshot of it, put it in our, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, we, we use, uh, when we were using Trello, Trello or uh, something else, which where we have like, these are the features and keep dumping there. So you know, when you want to go back, you have the place where you can look at it why it also contains some information of why did you take a make a particular decision right because two months down the line mind you today you may feel very confident that 
um i will never forget this for my life right but uh, two months down the line you will be scratching who the hell wrote this particular uh, code or who is who is the one who designed this kind of an architecture right you will be cursing yourself uh, uh, in in future so this helps uh, don't over engineer don't fret about that that will be there it is just that how do you minimize and slowly chip away with it and yes i mean as you grow don't kind of let it uh, let the debt grow into mountains and mountains right you will then again have to get a consensus and uh, within your team uh, so what we used to do is like every 6 months or so we used to have like two to three days uh, uh, overhaul kind of a thing where at least we used to remove all the dead code we may not change the architecture and all right but there will be lot of dead code which is not used uh, and if you want to remove it the most important thing is what arpit said you need to have tests whether it is manual whether it is uh, automated doesn't matter right but uh, we we used to do that and it fairly it used to work for us like i mean uh, once in 6 uh, months or so we used to remove major chunks of code and it was okay i mean uh, uh, yeah that that's all uh, yeah thank you ramji i think uh, uh, three things right testing 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 so, so those are the three things we all are teaching yeah. no, <laughs> so, but i think ramji's point uh, by the way ramji that's a great point that you made around the the automation bit that's something that, that it's a gift that keeps on giving like setting your ci pipelines or your you know some of this automation early on uh, just helps a lot in the long run yeah that's a really, really and uh, just my uh, two cents right though i am still not there at but i believe if you look at companies like google or facebook um like today they have the scale that they operate and all it's because of the automation and in fact they have teams which actually develop those internal tools to ensure that the quality is maintained right and that's more important i i believe that's their secret uh, much more than uh, what they throw out uh, to the users right uh, they probably have ma- 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 many more millions of lines of code to ensure that whatever they are putting it out uh, is correct right yes as a at an early stage you cannot do it but ensure you have basic basic uh, uh, stuff in place right yeah i think yeah, you're right i mean they, they they ensure that whatever they give us it just works right i think that's the yeah. that's the feature that we all need it should just work <laughs> so so uh, uh, before we move to uh, Uh, audience questions i have a la- i have last question because some of the questions that i wanted to ask uh, audience also have uh, uh, similar questions so we'll start taking audience questions so my last question is that uh, uh, when we are uh, thinking about uh, product right like you said uh, when you're thinking about cloud uh, just uh, obviously choose the cloud that uh, <laughs> is giving you the maximum amount of credits but as you scale you might uh, probably uh, want to go to different cloud right uh, for example in in our case uh, Uh, uh most of our customers are our uh, businesses large enterprises so they have uh, some of the needs right because they would want a certain uh, cloud uh, where they are comfortable and probably we have to either redesign the architect our product uh, because we never thought about going to a different cloud uh, and uh, this is more of a personal question right uh, when we are thinking about product should we think about a uh, uh, multi cloud strategy or just write uh, it for one cloud and then probably think about it when uh, the scale hits or when you think there is a customer paying for it right short answer to your question shubhendu is never multi cloud okay like i'm i'm dead against it uh, because uh, okay i'll expand on that uh, it's because 99% of the scenarios Or, or or you know startups or products or you know etc will never ever see a multi cloud requirement so i would never design for multi cloud from ground up uh, the fact that there are obviously a small niche of you know use cases where you want to handle like multiple clouds uh, and you want to kind of design for that uh, and in those cases i would sort of then maybe try to leverage platforms like maybe kubernetes or you know some 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 uh, platforms like that which makes the multi cloud easier but multi cloud there is no silver bullet multi cloud is insanely hard uh, more often than not when people actually say multi cloud like you said like you know like you are a lot of you you guys work with a lot of enterprises right so but if you're working let's say with uh, just a random example right like uh, let's say you work with swiggy swiggy might be completely on aws 
but uh, say Dunzo might be completely on SAR, uh, mm. and you might be servicing both these uh, clients, but your Swiggy installation is running completely on the AWS uh, stack, and your Dunzo installation is running completely on the SAR stack, and both these stacks have nothing to do with each other. You know, Dunzo and Swiggy don't need to communicate with each other. Yeah. So yeah. it's essentially single cloud for a customer. So a customer doesn't have to worry about because the problems that happen with multi-cloud is sort of syncing your data between your DB in Azure and your DB in, in AWS. And like maybe going cross-continental with your network requests and you know whatnot. So 99% scenarios, yeah, I wouldn't do multi-cloud. Got it. So uh, we were in that one percent scenario, Arpit. <laughs> so uh, in my at D Blue, when we were doing this ML uh, ops platform, we were building. I mean, though currently we pivoted to focus on uh, uh, monitoring aspects of uh, models. Um, it was multi-cloud, but uh, Arpit also gave the answer. Uh, it was built on Kubernetes, uh, so it made a little simpler. But mind you, even with Kubernetes, each of the service providers' Kubernetes offerings are uh, slightly different and that makes that's a pain to handle right i mean uh, it is not straightforward um i mean uh, we we you we we basically built it for uh gcp aws and uh, azure and mind you each of their hosted kubernetes operations there are slight nuances which are different from each other and which makes uh, which is a big pain for you to uh, build a platform which uh, abstracts away all those nuances right so uh Completely with uh, Arpit, don't don't uh, think about multi-cloud. The way I was thinking, uh, Subendu is a different uh, piece, which is maybe you want to build on a, cloud, a particular cloud, but you want to kind of get it running on other clouds also. Yeah. Uh, which uh, which is what Arpit was mentioning in his second point, right? Uh, that is a very very uh, practical thing. Uh, the thing that you will have to be aware of in that case is. Uh, uh, at least if you are unsure whether if you uh, you will have a situation like that don't commit yourself to a lot of hosted services these guys provide like let's say uh, it's easy to start off and if you there is nothing wrong with it i'm i'm not saying it is bad but if you think uh, you would have to run this on different uh, on a different uh, cloud uh, don't commit to a completely managed service that these cloud providers uh, provide unless it is a industry standard like you have MySQL, which all of these guys provide, which is good. But um, let's say you are using a service like, uh, like for machine learning, you are using like Azure uh, models or uh, AWS uh, SageMaker, right? Now, which will be very hard if you to move to a different cloud. So, I mean, this was a very easy example to give, but they have lots of other services which are very hard. Like, that. let's say you are using Redshift. Now, uh, that becomes a little harder to move. Uh, more than Redshift, in fact. Uh, if you are, uh, so I would probably look at Ethna as an option so that when I move to a different cloud, at least I can run my own uh, Presto cluster and get things running, right? So these things come in as much as possible. If you have such scenario, uh, try to stick to the core offerings, which is the compute and storage, because most of these things are uh, interoperable or you have uh, enough open source software to abstract away the differences. Uh, but the moment you start using any uh, managed offering from these guys be a little careful uh, because they don't uh, work at all in a similar fashion across platforms right so something like if you are using dynamo db then it may not have any equivalent in uh, azure though azure has its own uh, key value pair does it work with the same uh, uh, api uh, same uh, similar function calls and all it may not so please be aware of it yeah, that, that's the point that I had. Thanks, Anji. That's a very good insight, actually. Um, I guess our audience would have also understood when they're thinking about uh, probably maybe there is a there is a scope of another startup coming in uh, trying to pitch in uh, how to build multi-cloud strategies, right? <laughs> so I see a gap <laughs> as a founder <laughs> if there is money to be made there. So uh, Azar, I guess uh, uh, we are done with uh, our uh, set of questions. It'll be great if we can start. Uh, with some of the audience questions. I guess we have quite a good number of questions, so it will be fun to answer them. Other, uh, up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shubhendu. And uh, it was an amazing session. I mean, all our viewers out there, they've got a lot of information. And, uh, you know, 
uh, your, your, they got a chance to hear your experience. Now, like Shubhendu mentioned, so there are a couple of questions. What I'll do is uh, I'll be reading out the questions and meanwhile, I'll just uh, uh, show them on the screen as well so that it's visible for all of us and it's, it's much easier, right? So the first question that we have is from Anubhav uh, Ujwal. Uh, so like you can see, the, so this is the question that Anubhav has. What is the difference between the system design expectations of uh, different domains? Uh, that is, he's also pointed out some examples uh, that is of a gaming industry, for example, or a video processing industry. So uh, Arpit, maybe if you can go ahead uh, first, if you have something, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. Uh so there were a couple of cases. So for example, with gaming and video processing, especially. So when you say video processing, uh, again, there's like two different parts to it. One is sort of literally just processing a video and then, you know, sort of uh, putting it on a CD and like say Netflix, uh, and then sort of just streaming that later. Or it's uh, the way, you know, this uh, YouTube live stream is happening right now, wherein we are kind of literally recording the video and telecasting it at the same time. Uh, in both these cases, uh, uh, latency and response times uh, form like a uh, like a massive, massive uh, impact, not just on the experience of the user, but uh, literally on the business. Because uh, so when we were doing, uh, so we used to run a, a startup called Mob Show, which was literally a video based game. Uh, so we kind of fell into the intersection of both video processing and gaming at the same time. Uh, our server side latencies was uh, was 50 milliseconds uh, was 95 percentile uh, and uh, and we kind of like just stuck to that like the moment we would cross 50 milliseconds uh, we would just like any code that does this just no it does not go to production so uh, so there you have very very tight uh, sort of uh, uh, latencies and and especially in these scenarios you're willing to spend more money on servers on cdns on network whatever it is that gets you there because your user experience like and, and your user is, is some 15 year old teenager sitting in high school who cannot wait 50 more milliseconds for a response to come back from the server. So like that's the user that you're going after at that point. Uh, for a lot of B2B SaaS companies, it's okay. Like a second is, is fine. You know, like one second, your 95 percentile uh, response time is one second. It's okay. Nobody really cares. So. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those insights, Ashpit. Uh, Ramji, anything that you'd like to add on uh, to the same question? No, um, I guess this is uh, fine, right? Uh, there are some industries like gaming, uh, the video processing, and uh, probably uh, uh, if you are doing some kind of uh, uh, transactions, right, like uh, payments and all, where uh, the response times are very, very critical. Um, but outside of that, especially in B2B and all, you are good, right? I mean, uh, it doesn't mean your application has to crawl. Now, I've seen a few applications which crawl even uh, for B2B. But uh, you 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 have a, a little relaxed uh, constraints over there. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, for something like this, uh, especially if you are in B2C or anything, uh, consider the various options available on cloud. So. In my last, uh, 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 where I was working, uh, we built uh, a uh, event uh, event tracking, uh, clickstream tracking uh, uh, system, right? And uh, the constraint was it has to be 50 milliseconds from anywhere in the world. Like uh, any user, any consumer, um, they access that URL, uh, a, the constraint was about 50 milliseconds. Now, uh, I, initially I was worried, but then once you start looking at uh, these various cloud providers and the offerings they have, it actually becomes pretty simple. So some of these uh, you you have to kind of look at, but of course the downside is the cost is a factor. Like uh, you would have uh, uh, you will have to worry about uh, cost because now you are probably running uh, your servers on multiple regions rather than just one or two regions, um, which is okay. I mean uh, because you have such a requirement, you will have to kind of on the other side bear the cost. But uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, that that's all. Uh, not much. G one second. Uh, he's talked about yeah response times uh, and uh, costs. Costs are going to be high if you need a much better latency. Please be aware of it. And 
sometimes uh, it can go higher especially uh, be aware of the bandwidth costs if you are doing video or uh, heavy images and uh, stuff like that right uh, that can shoot up uh, a lot uh, be aware of it and keep monitoring it that's the more important thing on the cost front yeah All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramji, for those uh, lovely suggestions. And uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, so this is something which we have from Bhaskar Tiwari. What has been uh, your experience with serverless architecture uh, that is basically replacing any small microservice? And uh, should 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 he invest time in learning uh, the, the, the same uh, serverless architecture, is it any helpful? Uh, would it be any helpful for him as an architect? Yeah. So anyone, uh, maybe Arpit or Ramji, anyone can go ahead with the answer. Uh, Ramji, do you have? Yeah. Uh... I can, possibly. Yeah. So uh, I have had both good experiences and bad experiences with serverless, right? I mean, I wouldn't say bad, but uh, difficult experiences. See, um, I, I think where serverless helps a lot is uh, uh you don't know the kind of traffic uh, that you get it's a bit uh, uh uh it's a it's a bit uh, un uh, unpredictable and uh, the other thing is you also don't know uh, uh sorry not know uh, you have very limited uh, set of functionality right i mean uh, uh, you like where we use serverless was one of these things like event uh, uh event sync so just call the serverless function and uh, it will uh, uh, it, it will call the function which is there. Uh, that will it, it takes the, whatever is the payload that comes to this you are through this URL. It then puts it in a pub sub uh, message on Google Cloud, right? Uh, in such scenarios, for us, serverless work very well. Um, but uh, where it didn't work was uh, like when you have a, a complex application uh, which has a lot more, uh, uh, I would say, API endpoints and all. There, it was uh, very difficult for us to manage it. I mean. Uh, uh purely i mean from a performance i did not have many complaints but uh, purely from managing it across uh, different developers and all it was a pain i would have said like instead of doing that uh, we should just stick to deploying it on a server but then in that case uh, i didn't have uh, uh didn't have the control of the architecture it was there for a very long time and uh, the team was not reluctant to re was reluctant to relook at it uh, so my experience has been when you know the number of functions uh, or um, the API endpoint that you are going to call is very, very limited. Uh, there it worked. In fact, we have built a complete uh, UI based application uh, on serverless, right? The UI was on uh, uh, S3. Uh, it was as a static website on S3, completely built in React. And then it was uh, communicating uh, at the back end using the Cognito for uh, um, AWS Cognito for authentication and then uh, the services behind, right? Lambda uh, API gateway and their offer. Uh, but it was good because uh, we knew there were only some five, six functions to be called across in the application, and that was limited to that. A lot of other functionality was on UI, which anyway we could uh, get done with React. Um, so in, in, that was a very good experience. In uh, As I said, in another uh, thing, it dropped off. I, yeah, I believe there's some technical glitches no issues uh maybe arpit if you can uh if you would like to add on to no i think ramji has given a very you know sort of very detailed okay. sort of uh, i got uh, oh he's back, he's back. Uh, he, yeah sorry uh, i got disconnected so no, that should, was my point i mean uh, please be aware of that uh if you have a lot more endpoints on the, your apis and all i would not uh, venture into serverless but saying that you you should definitely learn serverless because um, there are uh, places where serverless makes a lot of sense, especially like uh, um, if you are in analytics and uh, I, I would suggest you should look at uh, something like AWS Athena or you should look at BigQuery because in fact, I would say that the BigQuery is the only product that I have seen uh, software which just works, right? Uh, Subendu was using this uh, phrase earlier in the day. Uh, just works is very hard in software very, very hard. And I think BigQuery is one of those very few softwares which can take that. So it's also serverless. You don't need to worry about any uh, server from uh, database. You don't need to worry about scale and all. And it works really well. So you be aware of what are the various serverless things available. It is not just only for uh, hosting APIs and all, right? Even database can be serverless. And um, I'm more uh, inclined to use something like that. 
like any day i would use uh, bigquery over any other hosted solution right because the time to market for me is very important and it is uh, it really helps there uh, so you you should spend time in understanding the nuances and pick up where it makes sense like if you have any kind of analytics workloads i would say pick bigquery don't worry about it um, any kind of uh, on aws you have the equivalent not as good as bigquery but uh, somewhere it comes a little closer which is uh, athena uh, if you outrun uh, the usage of athena for whatever reason then you can probably consider redshift right but again uh, i don't know they have redshift serverless also i don't know how it works but redshift you have to spin up a server and all which would be the way i would look at but coming to the building applications like uh, apis and all i would be careful much more careful there yes so arpit please go ahead uh, you wanted to add on something yeah sorry uh, no i think ramji has given like a very very comprehensive there's nothing i could add to that all right perfect thank you thank you so much uh, and uh, i hope that answers your question as well bhaskar a very detailed one in fact and uh, now moving on to our next question so there's another question which is basically uh, uh, and add on to what shubhendu was talking about so what he wants to know is uh, when scaling system architect uh, architecture to support more features and users what is the what are some of the most interesting uh, engineering challenges that uh, you have faced and what are some of the good practices that uh, you would suggest uh, for for our viewer out there so yes uh, arpit please go ahead uh, if you uh, like okay so uh again so uh, so yeah uh, so there are two uh, you know like uh, like faninda has uh, mentioned that there are two axes on which we kind of can scale like more features or more users uh, in terms of uh, users at least like i was saying earlier like when you are kind of scaling like crazy uh, start designing for failure assume that everything that you write is going to crash like like start with that assumption that your server you write code uh, your server is going to crash you are trying to process something in db your db is going to crash uh, so writing uh, you know sort of having that shift in mindset and philosophy in terms of architecture in terms of code that writing crash first software right assume failure and then work from there ki what happens if so a very uh, popular example of this was the twitter fail bail the reason that you know you know back in you know uh 2008 2009 the fail whale for twitter became like uber famous across the globe was because twitter was scaling like crazy and they kept crashing but the way they got better was handling those failures and moving forward okay, okay. we are going to assume that our server fails how do we still keep twitter up okay we are going to assume this happen and uh, an interesting anecdote over there is uh, when putin visited the twitter office in 2000 uh 11 i think 11 12 or something like that putin visited uh, uh twitter hq and uh, he like he signed up on twitter and did his first tweet from the hq and obviously you cannot fail i mean that is one scenario where you cannot fail when the russian president is in your office doing his first tweet so they literally set up an entire cluster an entire environment just for one user putin uh to ensure that putin will never see your fail whale so because they assumed that when putin is in office the world will know putin is here and the russians are going to start joining twitter so twitter will go down so they started with that assumption that twitter will go down when putin tweets so they set up an entire cluster just for putin so and and that's one way you kind of start looking at uh, uh yeah crash first crash first I think Arpit, I would love to have my Putin moment in some coming days. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, thank, thank, thank you, Arpit, for that uh, wonderful example as well. And uh, moving on to you, Ramji. Uh, so, anything that uh, you'd like to add on from your end, or would like yeah, to share? Yeah. So, your- cra- crash first is the first one, uh, right? I mean, uh, what Arpit said. Uh, and if you want to uh, understand actual examples of crash first. Uh, think no more than the internet protocol that we use all these protocols are uh, basically designed for failure right like uh, whenever a failure happens uh, how do you route the packets and also 
anybody who is from a cs background go back and open up your networking books uh, and uh, that that's one of the in my mind i mean internet works is an amazing thing right i mean uh, it's nothing uh, less than magic because uh, continuously there is loss of packets continuously there are disruptions in network and even then we don't uh, see issues uh, that is the biggest example that we live uh, every day so flash first uh, is uh, the thing right um the from my own personal experience the challenge that i faced was um, uh, at just eat uh, sudden uh, i mean uh, this was not a, uh, yeah this, this was a scale uh, this thing like suddenly during uh, our lunch time which is our highest uh, uh, orders every day normally our uh, database crashed and uh, i mean uh, it it took like almost 3 hours for us to kind of get the systems uh, back into uh, working condition right and that actually triggered in me like this was very early days of just eat when uh, i joined there uh, triggered in me like to put in a uh, put in an architecture and a system in place so that we need not worry about it um uh, and what helped me and i i continuously do that is kind of have a, a long i mean longish uh, goal of what you want to do so for me it was like okay uh, we used to get the maximum traffic on the 31st of december and i don't want my team to be constantly monitoring and uh, fixing the downtimes uh, uh, and all right uh, that is the kind of system we wanted to build that uh, the tech team should not even be uh, kind of worried about uh, whether we are going to hold the traffic or not and to reach there we took about one and a half to two years like uh, after taking the resolution the third uh, new year we actually did not have to sit through right we were there working with our ops teams we were working there with uh, the delivery uh, or the fulfillment teams and all but uh, the tech team did not have to worry about uh, whether the system is will work not work whether it will handle the scale right so uh, you you have to think take a long view of it but uh, yeah i mean uh, uh, the and this can only happen with the once you start looking at uh, uh, like you think of all the ways it can go wrong and then slowly attack each of those like you will uh, ha start having this uh, single point of failures so start identifying them and try to see how you can uh, get uh, away from them uh, yeah that's that's what i can add perfect thank you thank you so much i just uh, realized that uh, we've actually uh, you know exceeded the time uh, that, that, that is we were supposed to wind up uh, so we do have a couple of questions but i believe we can take them offline as well uh, so to all our viewers out there who have you know asked uh, questions i am sharing a link uh, for one of our discord uh, servers uh, a, a discord group where we have you know a uh, group of uh, architects and uh, system uh, i mean yeah uh, software architects who are uh, a part of that group we have some mentors and there are regular discussions which happen so you guys can post your questions over uh, the respective channel i'm sharing the link for the discord uh, server in the chat box so you can find it and uh, meanwhile thanks a lot for the uh, wonderful uh, you know experiences that you've shared arpit and uh, ramji and also i'd like to uh, you know ask shubendu to you know add on any last words that he has to our viewers and our speakers here thank you azhar uh, uh, arpit ramji i i learned a lot um, and there are some things that i'll go back uh, to my tech team and we'll discuss that we should be doing so i think from a strategy point of view i have got few things uh, that i will implement uh, what we will do uh, as there is i guess there are a lot of great questions but we don't want to take your time you you guys have <laughs> company to run right so what we will do is we will probably mail you these questions if it will be great if you can answer uh, some of these questions over an email in the next 2 3 days we'll put it on the discord server and uh, if you guys are okay i would uh, we would definitely like to cover this whole webinar uh, in form of a uh blog we just will repurpose the content because as uh, and uh, probably share it for for a bigger outreach right if you're okay with that i guess the audience would also lo love it to kind of revisit it in form of a text right where they can consume it in a more uh, easier manner so uh, that will be uh, all from my side uh, thank you ramji thank you arpit it was uh, amazing talking to you guys again <laughs> yeah uh this was a fantastic uh, sort of chat like thank you so much for organizing this uh, i had a lot of fun yeah yeah uh, same here uh, thanks shubendu and thanks uh, uh, azhar for uh, 
conducting uh, it in a very nice manner. Uh, uh, thanks, Arpit. Uh, got a good uh, insights. I really love the F1 uh, example. I guess that will stay with me forever. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing chat. Great. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.